Hello, I'm Jason Kelly. Thank you for joining me. In this video, I'll look at whether China is ready to lead the world economy. I recently spent time in Shanghai and Guangzhou and went shopping, rode in taxis on the trains, met people, talked to people, took pictures and took notes in exploring this idea because China is regularly presented in media as the next world leader. Its economy has grown well and it's always in the news conflicts with the United States, the current largest economy in the world. And there just seems to be this sense that, that we're, we're changing the guard here and that China is going to be the next leader. So let's look more into that. Is China ready to lead the world? Now, China has been growing like crazy. This is a GDP chart of growth uh, <clears throat> table, rather. And it shows you some plot points from China's historical GDP growth story. Now, this, by the way, is from an early March 2017 report to Kelly Letter subscribers. And this video will be condensing that report. And this is taken from that report. So you can see in 1998, China's GDP was $1 trillion. 2004, $2 trillion. 2007, $3.6 trillion. 2010, $6.1 trillion. 2013, $9.6 trillion, and 2016, $11.2 trillion. By comparison, the 2016 nominal GDP of the United States was $18.6 trillion. Japan's was $4.4 trillion, Germany's was $3.5 trillion, and the United Kingdom's was $2.8 trillion. So China's big, it's growing, it's getting bigger. And according to the Economist Intelligence Unit, China will overtake the United States as the largest economy in the world in 2026 by nominal GDP. As I see it, there are three problems with the thought that China can take over and become the world leader. One, it's not as developed as routinely presented in media. Two, it does not innovate. And number three, it's going to lose a lot of its manufacturing future with robotics. Now let's look at each of those in turn. Number one, China is not as developed as its image in media suggests. Look at these pictures of China. They invariably show the skylines of Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou as a testament to the country's rapid growth and modernity. This first one here is the Shanghai skyline taken by Hartmut Topler Photography. That's the Pudong skyline east of the Huangpu River, dominated by the Oriental Pearl radio and TV tower. The next shot here is the Beijing skyline from Alpha Coders, and that's the third ring road into the city center, past the oddly shaped and iconic CCTV building. And this next shot is the Guangzhou skyline from Momos Corral. That's the Canton Tower along the Pearl River. It looks very gorgeous. And all of these skylines are, are beautiful and deservedly admired. The problem is there's no depth to them. As soon as you get into those city centers, as soon as you go down some side streets, as soon as you interact with some people or observe construction underway, the image falls apart immediately. This is what makes it into media, and it is very beautiful and, and deservedly so, deservedly admired and shown, but there's just a paper-thin veneer quality to it. So let's look a little bit behind that veneer. The Shanghai Maglev train, for example, is the fastest train in the world, a commercial operating train. It goes 268 miles per hour. Now, as a fan of Japan's bullet trains, I was excited to ride it. What a letdown. From the attitude of the guy selling tickets to the image of the train on the platform, the even small details like the, the, the people on the platform being unable to tell me which was the front and which was the back of the train. Pretty basic stuff. Getting on the train and it was a bunch of rumpled seat covers and soiled. The digital readout showing me the, the speed and the time of day was broken, which is pretty disappointing on a train that's famous for its high speed and ability to get you somewhere quickly. That's just one example. Look at this. Inside the impressive city centers, it's easy to find outdated methods of construction using wood stick scaffolding. This is a shot I snapped in Guangzhou. You can see there, the guys, uh, that's not at all the image that you expect to see from, from some of the impressive towers and those beautiful skylines. It's a bunch of wood stick scaffolding and guys passing that, those wood sticks up and down. And the, the whole feeling of the place is very run down in third world, not at all futuristic like those skyline photos suggest. 
I also saw rundown streets with people carrying baskets of slaughtered chickens on bicycles. I saw urban wastelands of empty dormitories and flanking wide concrete lots covered in dust with a mangy dog limping across it. Really, really unpleasant scenes. This next one is another shot of the Guangzhou urban wasteland. And then the next one is what you see if you step back from the beautiful skyline of Shanghai. Look at that. You can see that skyline in the distance. The one that if you zoom up close on looks so futuristic and amazing and ready to take over the world economy. But look what happens when you back up just a little bit. You see that real Chinese people are not living in those towers and are not doing as well as those photos suggest. Let's look at a couple statistics. The real life experiences, uh, excuse me, the GDP per capita in the United States was $57,300 in 2016. It was $48,200 in Germany, $46,200 in Canada, $42,500 in the UK, and $38,900 in Japan. What was it in China? $14,300. Beautiful skylines? Yes. Lots of construction going on? Yes. A growing GDP? Yes. But not a developed economy. It is still a very underdeveloped economy. And the leaders of that country have been driving all the figures to a very thin layer of people at the top and inflating a lot of those and doing everything they can to look better than they're actually doing. I realize this is human nature and you can find examples of this in every country in the world, but it is going on to an unprecedented degree in China and we must notice that. This is ultimately, at this point, a very undeveloped economy with a thin layer of excellence on top, and it's that thin layer that dominates the image in media. The next problem is that China does not innovate. It just doesn't. Uh, you're probably aware that it's, it's the world's factory floor. It doesn't design much of anything. It's where more advanced economies send their designs to be built using cheap labor and cheap manufacturing costs all around. To take one example, the Apple iPhone is assembled in China. It's from a long list of parts made and designed elsewhere around the world and famously says on the back, designed by Apple in California, but it is assembled in China, mostly by uh, two companies, Foxconn and Pegatron, both Taiwanese, but most iPhones from Foxconn are assembled at its Shenzhen, China location. Now, the iPhone provides a really nice case in point of what the problem is in China. They don't design anything. They're just making things. Look at some of these photos. Here are some Foxconn workers in China putting the phones together. And there's a shot of the Foxconn floor with just all these workers in, in, in clean suits working on the iPhone and doing a very good job. But still, the question is, why don't they innovate? Why aren't they making something that was designed and engineered and planned and just born in China? A 2014 March article in Harvard Business Review titled, Why Can't China Innovate? placed blame on the restrictive environment created by state control, a force weighing down on universities and companies. The Communist Party, for example, requires placement of a representative in every company with more than 50 employees. Talk about a status quo magnet. I mean, that explains a lot. It doesn't explain the ripoff culture, though, and this is another symptom of the lack of innovation going on. China's theory seems to be, why create ideas when you can just steal them? The country is just awash in fake products. Look at this. Here's a story from Business Insider. It's titled, what it's actually like inside one of China's fake Apple stores. It was from a couple years ago. Look at this first one here. You can see the Apple logo there. And then it reads, there are more than 30 Apple stores in the southern Chinese town of Shenzhen. And that's where they're assembled by Foxconn. But Apple only has one official store and five authorized dealers in the area. The next photo shows them building an Apple store. And the, the, the tag is, Many of them have been kitted out to look exactly like real Apple stores. The sales staff wear blue t-shirts with a white Apple logo and display iPads, iPhones, and Apple Watches on the same wooden tables you'd see in a real Apple store. 
they are convincing. I mean, I've seen them myself, and it's it's amazing. Some of the employees think they're working for Apple. That's how thorough the ruse is. And then the final photo here from that, that Business Insider article. Some employees in fake stores in Shenzhen told Reuters that they were buying the iPhone 6S and 6S Plus, and this is a couple years ago, from the U.S. and Hong Kong, as well as China, and smuggling them across the border into the mainland. That's pretty pathetic stuff. And aside from being criminal and, and just reprehensible on, you know, on a very plain level, it, be lies the, it, it betrays the lack of innovation in the country, that there is an emphasis on stealing, shortcutting, getting ahead any way you can, but not putting in the hard work and careful R&D that's required to truly, truly push forward the progress of humanity. Even in areas where Chinese innovation is slick, it's derivative. For example, Jack Ma's Alibaba Group. There's Jack Ma in front of the company name and logo. This is a company that runs a set of web portals and e-commerce services retail operations descended directly from their Western counterparts. Amazon.com, eBay, Walmart, taking pieces of all those different companies. And it's based on technologies that were developed in the West. The internet, cloud computing, mobile operating systems. So the entire Alibaba operation, as far as I know, is all derived from these technologies and innovations and creations of the Western world and some of it from Japan. Now, it has succeeded spectacularly. Alibaba has nearly 50,000 people working for it and generates revenue of $21 billion. So it's really doing well. Um, it doesn't innovate, though. It just... Nothing new comes out of the place, except in creative financial reporting. It's quite innovative there. This is a story from Fortune from, uh, from September 2015. The headline, here's why one hedge fund manager thinks Alibaba could be a big fraud. The company claims to have shipped 278 million orders on a single day in November 2014. This story is a couple years old, but still pertinent to this. Now, that, to keep that in perspective, that's more than seven and a half times more than the 37 million orders Amazon shipped on that year's Cyber Monday. Now, we all know how big and successful Amazon is. Really? Alibaba did seven and a half times more business on its big shipping day? Another perspective setter, Amazon only had 244 million users at the time. And Alibaba claims in one day it shipped 278 million orders. This and a lot of other reports have given people pause about the supposed success of Alibaba. And I guess we could say it's not quite clear where the 40 thieves part of the Alibaba tale fits into this modern take coming out of China. I, I just don't see China becoming innovative soon. And I think a company, a country rather, cannot lead the world if it's not innovating, not creating, not breaking new ground. The third way, China's growth may not continue as expected due to the rise of automated manufacturing. China's manufacturing economy, robots are on the way. Look at this. <clears throat> now this is an automotive robot assembly line. And this is for cars. China does make cars, but it's not really its bread and butter. But it seems like this one will become common in all industries, not just automotive. Foxconn itself, the assembler of iPhones, plans to replace workers at its factories with Foxbots. That's what they're called. And it set a benchmark of 30% company-wide automation by 2020. You can see in this photo, there's, a, there's one of the Foxbots with the Chinese worker there. And the company is showing that it's really emphasizing this move toward automation. And already, one of its factories has replaced 60,000 employees with robots. And it's quite focused on bringing, bringing more robots online to the tune of 10,000 per year. And China claims it's going to have one-third of all industrial robots worldwide installed in China within the next few years. We'll see about that. My, my question, which is a pretty obvious one, is... If Foxconn's answer to automation is that it's going to be the most automated and it's going to buy robots that can put iPhones together, why wouldn't Apple just make its own robot-run factories? Wouldn't that be cheaper than subcontracting out to Foxconn in China, especially if we remove the cost of shipping from the equation? The whole reason Apple started assembling phones in China was to save money, right? So if that cost savings disappears because Apple, with 
$250 billion cash, builds its own factories in California, and other companies do the same, and smaller companies that can't build their own factories can certainly subcontract out to other companies that build factories in their home countries, China could be in deep trouble. How deep? Well, as of last summer, according to China's National Bureau of Statistics, Manufacturing provided 20% of urban employment. Sorry, that's not last summer. That's in 2014. And while China's service sector is gradually growing in importance, the industry comprised 41% of China's economy in 2015, according to Statista. So a significant slowdown in manufacturing would greatly harm China's overall economy. And I think that's why some of these estimated growth rates we're seeing from economists could be upended as automation grows. I think we're going to see a lot more reshoring and a lot more investment at home to get away from dependence upon China and just get more control over every part of the process of designing, creating, and delivering products and to cut out those critical shipping costs. China could be in deep trouble as automation rises. It is a little bit behind. And it's, it's trying to play catch up now, but it's behind at the moment. Consider this. This is as of last summer. China employed just 36 robots per 10,000 manufacturing workers, 36 per 10,000, compared with 164 in the U.S., 292 in Germany, 314 in Japan, and 478 in South Korea. This measurement is called robotic density and is one to watch in the years ahead. In conclusion, I do not believe China can lead the world economy because of these three reasons. It will be held back by its, its largely undeveloped economy. It does not innovate, and I think it's going to be greatly upended by the rise of automation in manufacturing. So read those stories about China as the next world leader with a gimlet eye, because there's a lot more to it than just the growth of GDP. And by the way, on that note, China had the largest GDP in the world in the early 1800s. In the early 1800s, it did. And how much influence did it have over the world in the next two centuries? Almost none. History was happening in China, but the rest of the world moved on really without China's influence. So just being biggest is not being the best. And this is about whether China is ready to lead. And I stick by my thought at the moment that no, it certainly is not. And I hope this gives you a better perspective than you can get from the mainstream media story on the subject. Thank you for watching today. I hope you liked the video, and if you did, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube and subscribe to the Kelly Letter channel. Kelly Letter subscribers, I will see you on Sunday, and everybody else, have a great weekend.